Welcome to the Town Hall Presents Performances with Alison Charney, Season of Hope. I'm Alison Charney, and in this series of concert and conversations with some of today's most sought after classical musicians, I'll explore the theme of hope while offering Preformance's signature ungoogleable insights into the music we make. I can think of no more perfect partner in this exploration than the historic town hall who sparked a new, more optimistic climate when it opened its doors 100 years ago. Together, in our pursuit of optimism, we will also address the existential question, if musicians are making music but there's no one there to hear it, have we really made music? My answer is not without you, our audience. By being here to listen, you, who are people from all walks of life who have come together here, even virtually, to engage in the arts, are playing a critical role in the experience we are going to share together. Welcome to Preformance's Season of Hope, violinist Eric Osato and pianist David Wee. Welcome, Erico and David. The two of you have this unique situation amongst most musicians that I know right now in that you have a musical partner um, with whom you do not have to be socially distant. Um, and so you can make music together at the same time. There are no latency issues in your home. How exciting is that? Let's talk about Corn Gold. So these two pieces um, are part of a larger work, Much Ado, a setting of Much Ado About Nothing. Nothing. And these are two sort of incidental scenes, a march and a garden scene. Well, the idea was I wanted to do this piece by uh, Ian Nail, a Troy, and I was trying to find something that would balance it. And uh, so we thought this corn go, which Erico thinks we played before, and I don't remember. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's good. I mean, I, us, yeah. I just pretend I haven't played it before, and it was fun. Um, yeah, that's funny. I guess when you've made music together for as long as you two have, it's easy to forget which pieces you've done and which you haven't. <laughs> Some people, some people don't remember where their first date was, and the two of you are disagreeing about whether or not you've played the corn gold. Maybe also just because you've played so much music in your life that there just isn't room to store it all. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah. So. At least that's my excuse for why I can't remember the things I can't remember. I think, well, there's just so much in there. There's not room for everything. You picked this piece very specifically because you felt it sort of goes with the Petroy. Yes, yes. Well, more, it gives more contrast. And as you can hear it, a little quirky. I don't know if quirky is a contrast to Petroy or if it's a similarity. <laughs> well, quirky more in a traditional way. Yeah. It's a little. Yes, yeah. a more romantic and traditional way, yeah. Korngold is certainly one of the more romantic sounding composers oh, yes. um, and became really famous for, for scoring movies. Right. Um, and so he's, he's known for that lush, yes. um, descriptive and illustrative sound so that, it, you know, it, his music makes you see things. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, and we, we hope to, you know, show some contrast between romantic playing and a different kind of romantic playing because I think that that Petroy is very romantic in his own way, uh, deeply romantic also, but it's just a different kind of romantic. Erico, can I ask you about voicing? Um, that's something as a singer that I don't have to really worry about. I mean, I suppose I have my own, singers have their own version of it. I think trying to achieve with a tone quality Amano vibrato, and uh, I guess touch of the bow, how much weight, and you know, you, you want to play somewhat clearly, or you want to have a little more uh, sound goes wide and deep and rich that way. And David, for the piano, voicing is a little, it's a different concept, isn't it? Uh, for, yes, for the intellectual player, uh, which I'm not, but uh, <laughs> I hope I voice 
you know, uh, instinctively. Yeah, it's, it's certainly bringing out different, uh, on the piano, you, you can have three, four voices going at the same time, you know, um, and so different lines are going and, and how, how you express them and separate them and, and combine them and which ones you stress more than the others. Uh, as I say, I, I, I am knowledgeable intellectually, but I play uh, totally unintellectually. So Erico, I wonder if David is like that in life away from the piano. Um, does, he, does he punch out his point in a conversation with you or does he just sort of let it work its way in so that you know instinctively which is the most important piece of what he's saying to you? I think it's both, but I think he's much more direct in person than uh, when he's playing on the piano. I guess piano playing shows much more layer of things, but well, certainly uh, he is thoughtful, but most often times because it's, uh, yeah, he wants to get point come across and you know you, you may not want to know the truth but you need to know the truth and there it is but i bet david I, having heard you play now several times both in this virtual format and live um i think that when there's something to be said and something that needs to be heard in the music you have a way of crafting it so that we hear it i hear everything i hear everything and more that i'm supposed to hear when you play why don't we now hear these two selections from Much Ado About Nothing by Korngold, played by the duo of violinist Eric Sato and pianist David Wee, March and Garden Scene. <laughs>
that was the march and the garden scene from Corn Gold's Much Ado About Nothing, played by Eriko Sato and David Wee. Eriko, I wonder about the heat. Does the heat affect the vi? I know that the heat and the humidity and the, or you know any air quality affects the piano strings. Um, does it affect the violin? Does your oh, violin okay. change? Yes, yes. Well, first of all, bow hair, uh, shrinks uh, or spread. I mean, to, to get stretch. so uh, stretch. So that at the summertime it gets a little long. So which means you have to turn it more. And then also humidity affects the uh, quality of sound and the violin itself. The uh, more hum humid uh, the weather is, tend to go a little bit not what you call bright, a little more soggy sounding. Um, humidity is humidity is good for the vocal cords, but <laughs> so if I had to pick, I would pick a nice wet, humid space. It's to sing in any day. Okay. Tropical. It's good. That's interesting. Tropical. Yeah, maybe that's the answer for me. <laughs> yeah. Just to always be in a tropical climate. You know, Erico, um, you and I have talked in front of an audience before about your violin bow. Yes. Um, at Merkin Hall, when you were playing some French music, you right. explained to us that you switched your bow for mm -hmm. that piece. And I'm wondering for these pieces that you're playing today for the Korngold and the Petroy and the Dvorak and the Brahms, are you using the same bow or do you use a different bow for the pieces? Well, I, I have used the same bow for this. I Only I think because uh, video is slightly different. I guess microphone is closer and I can adjust more with my playing where, you know, in a live hall at the distance, makes a big difference and you know little subtle things I I can do but uh, in a big picture I mean, sometimes I feel like changing a bow is and also it's fun to do it to fun change to the bow yeah, right fun to do it and did you get a new violin did I see that on social media yes yes we just purchased yes, yes. We That's have exciting a, a real baby it was born on June 28th <clears throat> Wow. Yes. And, and um, are you using that violin in these performances or are you using your old standard? Oh, old violin, but the uh, new violin is getting ready soon, I think. So in the future performance, yes. And um, what does it take to get the violin ready? What does that mean? Needs to, wood needs to vibrate more so that it gets, yeah more full potential of colors and uh, uh, response response yes yeah, so the wood needs to vibrate and so respond to the touch that what you do so is it right now a little bit uh, slow reacting it's like a what what so i need to go so you'll have to come back to Performance the Season of Hope later once your new violin is ready and we can yes, show off the new baby. Yes, I would love that. So I want to just talk to you both a little bit about the fact that you have let me crash your duo um, and let me sing with you for a couple of pieces. Um, Erico, you know how much I love making music with you and now I get to make it with David as well. It's been a real treat to work on these two very, very standard and very romantic and very beautiful pieces with you. But yeah. as we all know, and as I've spoken about on this show, it is really impossible to make music together at the same exact time if you are not in the same space. And so all these performances that people are seeing um, online now are being done by the magic of technology and not because people are playing at the same time. And so there would be no way for me to sing with you. You can't play and have me sing at the same time over Zoom or over Skype or over the phone or anything because the sound just doesn't happen at the same time for the two parties. So it's been, um, you know, throughout this journey of performance, a season of hope, I have started to get a, get a rhythm down for how to manage this ensemble music making. And um, I'm just so excited that the two of you let me crash your party. But this <laughs> is our first attempt. Yes. Uh, I don't know if 
we would do it with anybody else, really. I hope this works. <laughs> and uh, well, I can't wait to be able to do it with you in person. Right. You know, um, you know well, that's one of the, the points of all of this is, is, you know, A, to just answer this question for myself that I was having in the first couple of months of this, where I thought, you know, does it, am I still a musician if I'm not making music that people can hear? I, I don't know. And I really do think that we need an audience. We need, if the music just sits on the page or just stays in your living room, it, it doesn't really serve the purpose of, of music, except for, I suppose, nurturing yourself, which is fine. Um, but I think what we've all discovered, all of us musicians, that, is that we really have to figure out ways to get the music out of ourselves and into people's ears and, um, you know, if we're going to do it together, this is the only way to do it right now. The great thing is, you know, for the first time, people who haven't heard us play in decades, people from Australia, from Hong Kong, from Japan, they are hearing us play and, and I think they're enjoying it. And uh, this, you know, and that's priceless, but not, not that we want we would prefer this, but at least there's something very good going on. Well, you know, silver lining, again, thousands and thousands of people have watched the Season of Hope videos, and that, you know, it's more people than fit in the concert hall. Right. So we are reaching people, and I, I hope to all of you who are listening or watching that um, you'll stick with us. And uh, when we go back to a live format, format that you'll come with us back to the concert hall. Yeah. Here's my hope. Yeah, that will be exciting. Yes. So why don't we take a listen to two of my most favorite pieces, uh, Brahms' Vegan Lead, which you may recognize as the lullaby, and the beautiful Dvorak piece, Songs My Mother Taught Me. And this will be performed by me, soprano Allison Charney, violinist Eric Osato, and pianist David Wee.
And that was Brahms's beautiful lullaby and Dvorak songs my mother taught me with the Sato We duo crashed by Alice and Charney Soprano. I am so delighted to welcome composer Yonel Petroy to Performance's Season of Hope. Welcome, Yonel. Thank you, Alison, for having me. It is, I'm so happy you're here, and I'm so happy that David and Erica wanted to play your music. On episode three, I featured composer Michael Ching and the Arc Trio, and the piece that Michael Ching wrote for the Arc Trio, he calls Arrangements and Derangements, Interpretations of Schubert. And he takes Schubert songs and flips them upside down. And in this piece, you've taken a Handel aria and whacked it out. <laughs> I don't know. And I just wonder when I hear it, because there's no reference in the title, there's no clue to the audience when they just see the name of it, that they're going to hear a piece that is so evocative of something they may have heard before. And I would imagine that people who know the handle have one reaction and people who don't know the handle have another reaction. And that's my first question to you is, did you think about that when you wrote the piece? And then I want to ask you just about the piece, but the, I can't get over my, my own personal reaction to hearing it. Absolutely. The, the inspiration was handle piece uh, from Rinaldo Opera, La Chukia Pianga. I, I was self-seduced by the simplicity and also by the sadness. Just the, the sadness, um, kind of sadness, it's uh, also beautiful sadness. And uh, of course, I didn't want to add uh, more words to say uh, gypsy uh, beauty or sadness, or but so I said sadness, and, and this is the, the, the most important thing for me because for the titles, I think that sometimes we have to precise in a simple way, you know, and to call our piece in order that the audience, they, they get it probably from the beginning. So I think that everybody is aware of what, what does it mean as sadness. You know? That's really interesting. I've never actually given any thought, I have to admit, to what it takes for a composer to name their piece. That's a fascinating part of it. Do you, does that, do you, do you come to the title after you hear it, after you've finished the work or in the middle of the work or at the beginning of, do you get the idea for the, the, the big picture first and then go to writing or how, how, do you, how does that work for you, that process? Uh, I think that uh, most of my pieces I compose, now that you asked me, uh, I had the emotion at the beginning and the title came in the same time, you know, so, but sometimes, probably I modify it a little bit. <laughs> That's fair. Once you see what you've <laughs> yeah, got. Yeah, yeah. You have never heard the handle, and you want to look it up. Um, it mm. is a great aria from the opera Rinaldo by Handel, and the aria is called Lasha Kiopianga, Let Me Weep. Um, and now I think we should hear the Yonel Petroy version, uh, which he calls Gypsy Sadness, played by violinist Erico Sato, and pianist David Wee.
was Gypsy Sadness by Yono Petroy, played by Erko Sato and David Wee. Tell me about Gypsy Jumbus and tell me about that name, what it means. Uh, uh, Gypsy Jumbus, it's a, it's a joyful music. So this was my idea to, to, to switch from something um, uh, joyful to, to kind of sadness that, uh, that I uh, called the second piece. So Gypsy Jumbus was um, composed uh, in this very specific uh, time when I came to New York to play my first concert with the New York Philharmonic uh, uh, violinist Anna Rabinova in, 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 in 2005. And, uh, and the inspiration of, of Gypsy Jules was, as I said, uh, a joy, but it's a kind of uh, hectic joy. Uh, it's not a simple, simple joy like a Rossini, let's say, because we talk about Handel. It's a, uh, and the Jules, uh, it's a, uh, uh, kind of slang in the Serbian language, which means chaotic. Now, uh, this, let's say, we can say it's a chaotic joy, but uh, so I call uh, Gypsy. Now, why Gypsy? Because, uh, as I mentioned, that I was born in, uh, I didn't mention that, as I'm talking Serbian, I was born in former Yugoslavia from Romanian parents moving to France, so I entered in many, many gypsy cultures, so, and uh, and I, I found that it's a similarity in the, in the gypsy culture between joy and sadness. Well, you know, I always say to my children that you cannot experience one emotion without understanding the opposite emotion. So you know, like a like right. a like a coin, like a penny. You can't have the heads without the tails. You can't have joy without understanding sadness, or joy has no meaning. Um, yes. So I think it's a beautiful philosophical idea to to give us both sides of the coin. You know, it's interesting to me. I'm I'm fascinated by language as a singer. That would make sense. Um, and it's fascinating to me that one piece your title is in English, and the other piece it's not. And I wonder. I, is, is Serbian, is that your first language? Uh, first language was Romanian, Serbian, French, because I lived in France for many years, and now here, so it's English, the fourth one. And do you think in all those languages, do you, do you give, did you consider calling it Gypsy Chaos instead of Gypsy <coughs> Dumbus? Or I'm just curious how that happens. It was something natural to, to mix, you know, these two languages, let's say Serbian and, and, and English. You know, I, I always think it's fascinating when people who are bilingual or trilingual or multilingual, that yeah. they, certain words and certain feelings ring more truthfully in one language or another. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I think that I would prefer, in this case, to answer your question, to preserve this two languages together, you know, because Jumbus, oh, it's chaotic, maybe the translation, but it's more than, um, it's emotional for me, something, you know. I really admire people who have such facility to switch between languages, and especially, I think, in today's world and in today's America, um, it's so important to understand all the cultures that make this country great and to understand a connection between us and everybody else and that one of the bridges to other people is to understand language. And of course, another bridge, which is the beauty of what we do, is music, which right. is universal in its language. This is this wild and fun and fast piece. Um, is it hard to play? the way I play, which is just going all out for something, and it has to work with that one take for posterity. Uh, that, that makes it really kind of difficult. You know, I talked in um, episode four of Season of Hope, the episode that premiered just before yours, Will, with cellist Peter Seidenberg, and we were talking about this notion of collaboration, whether live or in this virtual way. And how when you're, when you're making music with somebody else, you often get sort of past the ball, like in football, um, 
in a way that maybe you hadn't anticipated and in a way that maybe isn't the most comfortable, but you got to run with it. You've got to take that past the way it's given to you and then turn it into magic. Um, and in a way, that's just what you're saying now that, you know, you have a piece like this and you just start and it takes you where it takes you. And if things aren't exactly as you had planned, maybe it would go, you've got to just keep going, get to the double bar at the end. Well, this piece actually is like a gymnastics almost. I mean, it's, it's for, I don't know, for the violin, it's, it sounds so crazy too. I, I think the balance of going really crazy, effect of craziness, but he write actual notes. So to try to be somewhat accurate, you know, so sliding up and down, but landing in this, some kind of a right pitch is a challenge. Yeah, and absolutely, you know, you feel like you're just going up and down for no, you know, just the effect of it, but actually actual pitch itself is involved and harmonies. So I try to be accurate and, you know. Well, knowing you as I do, although I have not seen this piece written down on paper, I'm going to guess that you're pretty darn accurate, Eriko, as you always are. Oh. Um, the thing about Eriko's playing is that she is, David, I'm sure you'll agree with me, she is accurate as can be, but always filled with so much soul and heart. And I hear her play, and I, I mean, so often, Eriko, you bring me to tears, even when I'm on stage with you. <laughs> So. Oh, thank you. That's part of, like a violin is a vocal line, isn't it? So that's what I'm trying to achieve. Yeah, well, you certainly sing on the violin. And um, I'm excited now to hear the duo, uh, husband-wife duo of Eriko Sato and David Wee playing Yonel Petroy's Gypsy Jumbus. <laughs> Thank you. 
that was Gypsy Jumbus by Yono Petroy, played by violinist Eriko Sato and pianist David Wee. David and Eriko, I am so grateful to the two of you for being a part of my life. Eriko, for all of our collaborations in the last couple of years, I, I am so grateful to our mutual friend, pianist Anna Wang Friedman, who's appearing on this show uh, one episode after you. Um, I'm so grateful to her for bringing us together. Yes, same here. And I appreciate your sharing your music with all of my listeners in these very strange and isolating times. And um, again, I know that this is not something that you've done before in terms of branching out and making music with somebody not living with you in these times. So I really appreciate your letting me sing along. And um, here's to being together in person. Thank you so much for talking to me today. And thank you for continuing to compose music. And thank you for these beautiful pieces that David and Erico are performing on Season of Hope. And um, I look forward to seeing you in person sometime soon. I hope to. And thank you so much, Alison, for having me on your platform. Of course, thank you to David and Erico, great performers and as you mentioned, we have to have these two pieces in the real concert hall. In, to the real concert hall. To the real concert hall, <laughs> yes. I close every performance the same way with Richard Strauss's 90 second long gem, Su Eignung, a piece filled with dunk, with thanks, because I am always truly so overfilled with gratitude at this point in the program. I'd like to thank the town hall for hosting me and Season of Hope. I would like to thank the Friends of Performances for their generosity and all of my featured guests for their brilliant artistry. This series would not be possible without the creative and technical input of Mele Araya, Lawrence Zucker, Jeff Mann, Nevin Steinberg, and Evan Epstein, who join me in offering special thanks to you, our performances Season of Hope audience, for giving us all a reason to keep the music playing. And now, Sue Eichner.